Hey, what's up? It's Dave from I'mSimplyYourDad.com, and you're watching the Happy Healthy Family Podcast. On the show today, we have one of the leading experts in gut health and the microbiome, Karan Krishnan. Uh, Karan, welcome to the Happy Healthy Family Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And so, Karan, we're going to challenge you today. We're going to—it's got a mission impossible, if you will. <laughs> I, uh, a few weeks ago, I put out this question on my Facebook. You know, trying to figure out and plan for future podcasts. So I asked people what they wanted to learn about. And one of the things that came up was they wanted to know how to permanently transform their microbiome in a yeah. positive way. So that is your mission today. Yes, <laughs> yes. I like it. I, and I wouldn't call it Mission Impossible. It's, uh, it's mission quite probable, actually, if you, uh, if you understand enough about the microbiome. I love it. Mission quite probable. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's that's a, a new movie series coming out, I think. Um, <laughs> Produced by Microbiome Labs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> starring a super nerd. <laughs> Rather than a really handsome debonair guy like a Tom Cruise. <laughs> super nerd going around sprinkling bacteria on everybody. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Okay, so speaking of gut health, so we know that it's pretty much, you know, super incredibly important, yeah. and, you know, to man maintain our, our health and to if any any healing or, or anything from chronic symptoms or anything has to come, should probably start in the gut. You know, we've yeah. all heard the whole, you know, disease starts in the gut, so healing should start in the gut too. So, but, um, you know, our microbiome, it helps us produce neurotransmitters it maintains our gut lining helps us digest our food you know so it's super super important yeah but uh you know there's all these things that mess up our microbiome you know toxins yes. in the air the food we eat you know glyphosate of course which i'm gonna ask you about later yeah. um but sort of you know the biggest thing that we all think about is messing up our microbiome is of course antibiotics Mm -hmm. So can you just talk about what antibiotics or maybe just what a single round of antibiotics does to our microbiome and our gut? Yeah. Um, you know, and I want to preface that by saying, you know, there, there are numerous cases where antibiotics are absolutely critical and necessary and they will save lives. Um, so, you know, not to just bash antibiotics across the board, but but that being said, even the CDC estimates that, and this is probably a very low conservative estimate, but even the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, estimates that over 50% of antibiotic prescriptions are unnecessary. You know, they're being prescribed for things that the antibiotic aren't going to help you with. Everything from a simple cold or flu, which is a viral thing, uh, to, you know, with kids with chronic ear infections and sinusitis and um, so on. And then there's a lot of prophylactic antibiotic use. You know, dentists are some of the biggest uh, prescribers of antibiotics, and they typically prescribe prophylactic antibiotics um, before uh, procedures in the mouth, you know, before tooth extractions and things like that. So even though, you know, antibiotics can be a, a lifesaver in certain cases, the, the overuse is really quite significant. And, um, and and some of it, and we'll talk about this a little bit too, some of it is um, the blame of some of that is on us, you know, as, as a patient population. I'll talk about what, what that means. Um, but, you know, studies show that a single round, a seven-day course of clindamycin, very common antibiotic use for, you know, bronchitis or um, sinusitis or even skin disorders to some degree, um, will can disrupt your microbiome in a very significant way for up to two years. Oh, you wow. know, and, um, yeah, one round of seven days. You know, we actually just finished a study that we're submitting for publication that shows seven day course of clindamycin dramatically change not only the microbiome at the species level, which is, you know, what we typically look at, but in the functionality level very significantly because we were measuring the inflammatory response that the microbiome had. And what we saw was after the treatment with clindamycin for seven days, that the, that the microbiome tended to have a, a higher uh, prevalence of increasing inflammation in the gut. So the types of organisms that became more prevalent in that time were organisms that would stimulate inflammation more than more than the 
organisms that were more prevalent before the antibiotic. The other thing is then we also took the uh, antibi- uh, the microbiome slurry from from the guts that are treated with um, with uh, clindamycin, and then when we tested them on intestinal lining, uh, which is an in vitro in- intestinal lining system, we found that they made the intestinal lining far more permeable. You know, so so the dysbiosis that can be caused by antimicrobials actually will have other subsequent um, amplifications through the immune system and also by triggering uh, leakiness in the gut. You know, so the the most apparent danger with antibiotics is the the um, secondary um, overgrowth of pathogens. You know, the most well known is C diff, right? C diff is associated with taking courses of antibiotics, um, so where you get a an opportunistic pathogen overgrowth like that. But the part that's not talked about as much is what we showed is that if you use an antibiotic, it might make your gut more leaky which then increases chronic uh, low-grade inflammation, which is the foundation of most chronic illnesses. And then also it can make your gut more inflammatory, which makes it more susceptible to other conditions. And that's just in a seven-day course. You know, and um, let me explain another study that was really interesting. Um, And I don't know if this study is published yet, but I get to go to a lot of research conferences and I get to hear studies that are being done by researchers that are not yet published. This is part of the work that they're doing. This researcher did a very interesting trial where they showed, um, where where he took a a microbiome and and then he exposed um, the microbiome as a collective to several different types of antibiotics. And what he saw is within about, you know, uh, a couple of hours, the microbiome bacteria count dropped by 99.8%. You know, it killed, antibiotics killed everything across the board in a huge way. Now, the microbes, within about eight or 10 hours, they'll start to bounce back. They'll start to regrow. One of the problems is they regrow now in different proportions than they used to be, you know, because the environment is now different. So that's problematic. But what was really fascinating about the study that he did is then when he took each individual species in the microbiome and exposed them to the antibiotic, the same antibiotic that he exposed a collective, 98% of them were resistant to the antibiotic. Right. So that brings up the question, like, wait a minute, if 98 percent of the bacteria in this population are resistant to the antibiotic, then why is it when we expose the population to the antibiotic, everything dies? Right. And that just speaks to the importance of the community structure within the microbiome. It also speaks to the importance of certain types of strains that we call keystone strains. And these are species within the microbiome that really kind of hold up the rest of the population. You know, they play such a critical role in maintaining the function of all of these other microbes within the the community that if they are affected, everything else kind of falls apart like a house of cards. You know, that's that's really significant. And then let me not to go on too long, but let me give you one more really interesting tidbit. This is from a study that was published. Um, This researcher was following individuals who were about to get a course of antibiotics. So this is from Johns Hopkins, I believe. So they had collaboration with clinicians there and they said, okay, if you have any any patients that you're about to give an uh, a antibiotic prescription to, uh, you know, see if they were interested in enrolling in the study. And then if they are, then what they would what they did is they took a microbiome analysis of those people, you know, right before they started the antimicrobial, uh, the antibiotic. And then they they took it, you know, after the course of the antibiotic. Uh, compared the two, and then they they followed that individual and took samples all the way up to six months after the course of the antibiotic. A couple of things that they found that were really interesting. Number one is, sure enough, right after the course of antibiotic, there's a significant disruption to the microbial ecology in the microbiome. Even more interesting than that is at six months, that disruption was still there, right? So it did not revert back within that first six months. But here's the part that's kind of mind boggling and mind blowing. They also decided to follow individuals that lived in the same household as the individual taking the antibiotic, right? Those people did not take the antibiotic. They just live in the household that the person did. And those people saw the same disruption to their microbiome as the individual who took the antibiotic, characteristically the same. So that is kind of crazy when you think about it that if you know, if you and I are roommates and I took a course of antibiotic, it actually affects your gut as well. And you see the same disruption 
in your microbiome as as my uh, my antibiotic exposed gut has. So, you know, it's it's really kind of mind boggling how how um, uh, vulnerable our microbiomes are to the stuff that we're surrounded by, even if we're not directly ingesting it. That is is just wild to think that that the people in in the household or you know that you're you're living with affects you that badly. But they yeah. always talk about how people share microbes. So wouldn't it be like the person who didn't take the antibiotics? Shouldn't you wouldn't you assume that that healthier person would transfer some of their healthier bugs to them? You would hope, um, and that that was kind of one of the hypotheses behind the testing of the other people. Is you know maybe the other people's guts are are you know not affected directly because they they're not taking the antibiotic, and maybe they can influence the antibiotic exposed gut in a more profound way. But it, it the reverse was true, um, and and likely that is because the the change that the antibiotic creates is so profound, and the prevalence rate of certain microbes that go through the roof when antibiotics are, are presented into the gut, that change is so profound that that change has more of an influence over what would be a kind of a standard normal gut than a, how a standard normal gut could have a change on, a, on an infected gut, you know? So think about it this way. It's like, um, you know, you've got a, a, a relatively healthy microbiome. Let's say you've got 600 different species in your microbiome and they're all represented at relatively the same amounts, right? So one of the ideas behind diversity in the microbiome being uh, a component of health is not only is it the richness, which is the number of different species, but it's also the uh, uniformity of the of the population. So the population is not uniform, meaning certain species are predominant over others, then you still don't have a healthy microbiome. So you need both richness and uniformity. So Presumably, in the in the person that lives with the person taking the antibiotic, let's assume their gut was healthy, so they have five six hundred species. They're fairly uniform. Any one of the and that that person is you know putting out those microbes into the atmosphere where they live. They're putting small levels of each of those microbes out into the atmosphere. That may not have the same impact as putting out very high overgrown levels of a couple of species into the atmosphere because of the antibiotic, right? I, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but... Yeah, that makes uh, sense. Right, and we excrete microbes in many different ways. And, and in some cases, the dysbiotic microbes may excrete even better. For example, one of the ways we excrete microbes is just through flatulence, just through farting. So mm -hmm. farting, you know, and we, we think of farting uh, besides the uh, olfactory offense that it creates. We don't really think of it as, you know, defecation. But in fact, when you fart, you actually release a lot of bacteria into the air, you know, and, and if you're sitting on a couch and you fart into the couch, you're actually inoculating the couch with your with your bacteria. And then the next person that sits on it gets exposed to that same bacteria. And, um, and then, you know, like when you go to the bathroom in the toilet, um, you actually end up with, um, when you flush, that vortex that's created by the flushing will actually aerosolize a bunch of that bacteria into the air. And then your, you know, your vent venting system picks it up, it sucks it into the intakes and then circulates and pushes it back through every vent in the house. So you're circulating uh, poop and poop bacteria all over the place. And then, uh, you know, and then if you take a look at skin, uh, like cells, um, when you look at dust, you know, 90% of the dry matter of dust, household dust is skin cells. And when you look at skin cells, for every one skin cell, you've got 30 or so bacteria that are sitting on that skin cell. So there's, you know, all the dust that you can see, if you don't dust for a couple of days, that's 30 times that amount in bacteria on the surface. Um, and so we're, you know, so if I'm taking an antibiotic and it's affecting the types of bacteria that are growing on my skin, the types of bacteria that I'm excreting through defecation, through farting, all of this stuff, I'm going to be throwing this stuff out all over the place. That's wild. I think a lot of people probably got grossed out there. So my, yeah. next time <laughs> next time their kid farts on their couch, they're going to be like, okay, I'm moving away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or their you know, husband or wife or partner farts in bed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, like, it it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, gives a whole new meaning to hot box. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But so, okay. So antibiotics are terrible, basically, uh, you know, unless they're, you know, needed to save your life. Yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of us out there who've had 
repeated regular rounds of antibiotics. I myself, there was a period of two, three years where I had, you know, 15, 20 rounds of antibiotics for Mm -hmm. just repeated recurring sinus infections. And my son, who's 13 now, when he was like two days old, he had to have IV antibiotics for three days. Mm -hmm. And then before he even turned three, he probably had at least 10 rounds because he just kept getting sick because obviously his gut microbiome got wiped out at birth you know so yep. like what about for people like us is there still hope to heal our microbiome or are we still just like fighting a futile battle yeah so in fact um multiple courses of antibiotics within a certain period of course create more and more dysbiosis but the thing about bacteria is uh, you can never kill 100 percent of bacteria you know, and this is evident if you look at household cleaning products that are antibacterial, all of them claim 99.9% of, of germs, right? So that's the claim they make. They can never say 100% because you can never kill all of a, any microbe down to even the very last cell. You know, that's just how resilient and all that microbes are. So even though you've had multiple courses of antibiotics and you have severe dysbiosis, a lot of those good bacteria are actually still there. They're just at such a low level to where they're not really functional, you know, and, and the thing is, there's through certain strategies, you can bring them back, you know, because it's an ecological problem, you know, and then, and if you think of it as an ecology, um, there are many things that you can do to influence that ecology and bring back species that are at the brink, you know, so you basically have a whole bunch of good beneficial bacteria that are at the brink and staying at the brink for, for the rest of your life. And you have species that have taken advantage of those, um, you know, forces coming into that ecology like antibiotics and so on and have become predominant, you know, and and then now you feel all the symptomology associated with that. But it's never too late and it's and it's never too impossible to revert that. Um, You know, that's why that's part of the reason why they even develop things like fecal transplants with the idea that, okay, maybe some guts are, you know, at a point of no return and we just need to transplant in somebody else's microbiome. Uh, but there's a reason why fecal transplants, you know, by the FDA rules are only um, restricted to certain cases of C. diff. Um, and that's because it's really very hard to take somebody else's characteristic microbiome and implant it into another individual because your microbiome actually has a signature to it. And that signature is kind of a lifelong thing in a way. Um, so those microbes that were there, that were good, that were beneficial, that, that um, alleviated you from having the symptoms and conditions, they're still there. They're just at such a, a, um, inconsequential uh, levels that you don't, they can't exert their influence. Um, so you can. You can always go back. If you had a healthy microbiome at some point or, or at least a functional microbiome, you can always go back. Well, that's certainly uh, hopeful for for those of us that have had, you know, those for our lives, basically, at least one round per year. So I'm certainly glad to hear that. Um, One more question before we get into sort of how to fix our our microbiome is I know you talk a lot about something called endotoxemia Mm -hmm. and the negative effects of lipopolysaccharides. So can you talk about what those are and how they impact our health? Yeah, so lipopolysaccharide is called an endotoxin, and then it's a big long word, lipopolysaccharide, we'll abbreviate it as LPS, so that's how we typically refer to it, LPS. Um, They are an endotoxin, and what that means is um, it's a toxin that's generated from within. That's where the endo word comes from. Um, A toxin that you would pick up from the environment is called an exotoxin. So that's something that comes in from the outside. Now, the thing with an endotoxin is because it's generated from within, you can't get away from it. You know, it's in your system. Uh, An exotoxin, like a mole toxin, you can leave the environment or whatever it may be you might do to change your exposure levels. But when it comes to an endotoxin, changing exposure levels is virtually impossible, you know, or, or at best really hard. Um, but it's a component, it's a, it's basically a fatty acid um, that is in the cell, uh, cell membrane structures of a certain group of bacteria called gram-negative bacteria. So every bacteria in the world, including every bacteria in your gut, 
can be classified as either gram-negative or gram-positive bacteria. What that actually means is, is unimportant from a microbiology standpoint. The only important thing to, to understand about that is gram-negative bacteria have this LPS. And gram-negative bacteria make up a large proportion of the microbes that live in your gut. They're not all bad either. You know, a lot of your good bacteria actually are gram-negative bacteria. Um, of course, a lot of the pathogens, especially in the small intestine, also tend to be gram-negative. So that being said, you've got this population of bacteria in your gut that you can't get away from that make LPS. LPS, when it's sitting in the membrane of the, of the bacteria, is not at all a problem for us. Bacteria use it to communicate as a binding protein, as a binding receptor, um, and so on. And it's also an important recognition tool for our immune system to recognize bacteria. Our immune system mm -hmm looks at LPS as a bacterial construct. And so that's one of the ways it recognizes whether something it sees is a bacteria, it's a fungi, it's an amoeba, whatever it may be, right? So that's a recognition tool. Now the problem occurs is when the bacteria in your gut die and the, the cell splits open. And then when the cell splits open, they release this LPS into the lumen of your intestine. The lumen is a tube that, that goes through the intestine where the food and all that passes through. When it's in the lumen, it's not really a problem, but LPS tends to have an affinity to migrate through the mucus layer and to, towards the intestinal lining. Um, and if your gut happens to be leaky, then that LPS is gonna leak all the way through into your circulatory system and now enter your body. Now this happens predominantly during eating. One of the th reasons is because um, the, just the process of eating alone kills bacteria, right? You release a lot of HCL, that starts to kill bacteria in the front part of your small intestine. Your body also, your small intestine releases a whole bunch of bile. Your gallbladder releases it into your small intestine. Uh, but that bile is a very strong antimicrobial and kills off bacteria. Just the food passing through the pancreatic enzymes, the peristaltic activity, all of that digestive process kills bacteria. Mm -hmm. And bacteria die and they release the LPS. Now, assuming your gut is not leaky and you've got a healthy gut, a couple of things will happen when the LPS is released. Either A, it just binds with the food and moves out. Um, or B, you've got microbes in the gut that can actually sequester and, and get rid of the LPS. Um, C, you've got secretory IgA being squirted out all the time by your immune cells. That will neutralize LPS. And, if, if the, and then you've got a thick mucus barrier that doesn't allow the LPS to migrate through. So we've got protective mechanisms in place to prevent this LPS from getting into the place we don't want it to enter. But if your microbiome is not healthy and your gut is leaky, then the LPS after eating a meal will leak through into your circulatory system. And once in the circulatory system, it becomes one of the most toxigenic things that we are exposed to on a regular basis. You know, it is, it is the number one driver of um, uh, serious uh, chronic illnesses like cardiovascular disease. It's the number one driver of heart disease, of diabetes. It's, a, it's the primary insult that starts the process of diabetes. It's a primary driver of obesity. It's a primary driver of numerous cancers. It's a primary driver of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. You know, so all of these dysfunctions <clears throat> and also several autoimmune diseases. It, it, it's a trigger for autoimmune disease as well. So there's all of these disruptions, including things that aren't necessarily disease associated, but are really a negative impact on our quality of life, like you know, short-term memory loss and brain fog, because this crosses the blood-brain barrier. It gets into the places like the amygdala and the hippocampus, and uh, you know, slows down brain function. It can actually interfere with serotonin and dopamine binding in the brain, so it brings on anxiety and depression, all of these things. So, you know, this LPS is a very pervasive toxin. Um, that is supposed to be sequestered in your intestine and, and taken out through defecation. But when your gut is leaky and your microbiome is not healthy, then that stuff leaks through every time you eat a meal. And it becomes the foundation of chronic illness. Now, can it cause all those different things? Because it depends on where it like sort of ends up settling. So if it settles mm -hmm. in the heart, it can cause heart disease. It settles in the brain, it can cause all those cognitive. Yeah, and more often than not, it causes multiple things. You know, somebody... Mm -hmm is chronically exposed to LPS, which the vast majority of people are in the Western world. I mean, in our in our first study where we were studying 
if we can stop the migration of LPS into the circulation. We did it on healthy, young, normal individuals, no disease states, no symptomology, any sorts, no medication. And in that population, we saw 55% of them had severe leaky gut with LPS leaking in in very significant amounts um, every time they ate food. Right. And that's in that population. So if you have a population that has any symptomology, that has any kind of condition, the prevalence rate is likely up in the high 80s and 90s. You know, and so in those people over time with that chronic exposure, the LPS will cause a whole host of conditions. You know, that's why we have something called multiple chronic diseases in the typical Western population. The latest statistics are that. Uh, over 40% of our population has more than one chronic illness. Wow. That's a very significant yeah. number. You know, it's insane. And more than one is, you know, two, of course, but many of them had as many as seven or eight chronic illnesses. Yeah. You know, so, and, and how, uh, you know, in your world and the people that you come across with, you know, how often do people have, you know, lupus and Hashimoto's and a skin dysfunction and uh, SIBO, IBS kind of symptoms, all of these things put together in one, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, they have uh, histamine intolerance and SIBO. I mean, those are two very different conditions um, but and, and could be considered to be multiple chronic conditions. Rarely do people just have one issue. So what... Is there a way to get these LPSs out once they've settled into our tissues? Uh, no. So your immune system has ways of trying to deal with LPS. So we produce a protein called LBP, which stands for LPS binding protein. That's how important it is for our immune system to, to keep LPS levels at bay. They produce a very specific protein just to go around and find and bind up LPS. Um, but the act of doing that triggers inflammation. That's a problem, right? So because inflammation is like a signal in your immune system that something is wrong. So even though your body has capabilities of trying to remove LPS, just the action of removing it triggers um, significant inflammation. Hmm. So so really the, the, the goal here is to keep LPS from migrating through and actually entering into the system. So should we not, so we, we can't really do anything about it, just sort of supporting regular immune function would be all we could really do for from like the, already damaged or already leaked LPS. Yeah. From the immune, from that, from that perspective, no, you can't do much about it. Mm -hmm. Now LPS comes in, it spikes after uh, about five hours after a meal that triggers a huge cascade of systemic inflammatory response. And then it'll settle back down again until the next meal, you know, it'll start to come down. So you, you go through this daily constant spiking of LPS through the system, and that constant spiking continuously triggers inflammatory response. So if I could go in and fix your gut right now, you're probably dealing still with the inflammatory response from your last meal, right? But if I fix your gut right now, then you're not going to have an inflammatory response on your next meal and the meal after that and so on. And over the next day or two, the inflammatory response from your previous meal, the last time you had a big LPS influx, will come down and come back down to normal levels. The problem is we never give it a chance to come back down to normal levels because we're eating three, four times a day. And, and if our guts are leaky, then every time we eat, we get a big spike. Hmm. That's really interesting because I'm thinking about my son again and he eats often, you know, I mean, he's a kid, so he eats three meals a day, a couple snacks a day, yep. you know, Less with me, more with other people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and other people seem to have more behavioral issues with him, more challenges controlling him. So that yeah. that really makes sense. So let me ask you another thing. Can LPS be a reason why you get tired shortly after eating? Um, yeah. So part of it is de depends on the hormone response to the food that you ate, right? So we know, like, if you have high tryptophan in the meal, that'll trigger... Um, hormones that that make you sleepy, like the whole Thanksgiving meal thing right. with turkey in the meal. But absolutely, I mean, you know, there's a couple of things that happen when you eat a meal. Number one, the energy requirements of digesting the food itself are so high that your body does tend to divert lots of energy to the digestive system. So it brings down the metabolic response in other parts of the body. Um, the, the second issue is that if you don't have a healthy 
metabolic system, then then your body's going through this this um, you know conflict of trying to uh, maintain sugar levels that are healthy in the blood and, and yet uh, produce energy. And one of the ways that it does that is it it increases insulin so that your cells take up sugar so you don't have a bunch of sugar floating around in your blood but then it also amplifies something called um, cyclic amp which is supposed to trigger the rest of your body to burn fat for fuel now if you don't have you know adequate fat burning capacity if you don't have um, adequate production of things like short chain fatty acids then you're not going to get that fat based up regulation of of energy and and then your body's focusing on bringing sugar back into the cells rather than burning it off for energy. So then you've got this energy discontinuum that's occurring. In a healthy microbiome, what happens is your microbiome produces signals during the process of digestion to upregulate this fat burning signal. So that as you're eating, all the rest of your cells that are sitting around with fat storage will start cranking up fat burn to provide you energy during the process of digestion. With many people, that system doesn't work that well. So you get you know, this lull in energy. Then the third part is the systemic inflammation that you get from um, from LPS definitely has a, um, an aberrant effect on energy production. LPS can get into the mitochondria of cells and actually disrupt the mitochondrial response. So imagine, you know, just the same way where your energy is shot when you're sick, right? When you've got a cold or flu and all that, um, your immune system is overworked, and so it brings down your overall energy output because your immune cells are taking up so much energy to try to protect you. That's the same thing that happens when you eat food. Um, you, you're familiar with the condition of sepsis, right, and bacteria. Mm-hmm. That's a blood poisoning, blood infection. Everyone knows how scary that is because you could go from walking and talking and being a normal person to being on death's doorstep in 48 hours if you have sepsis. The, um, the migration of LPS into the circulatory system and the type of inflammatory response it triggers is the same exact mechanism that sepsis triggers in your body. So that what we're dealing with every time we eat food, if our gut is leaky, is we're dealing with a sepsis in our system every single day, three times a day. Wow. That's a lot for your body and immune system to handle. Right. And that's how food, you know, the process of eating and the food causes disease. Now, you said uh, in one of your, your YouTube videos, I think, you said um, that saturated fat actually causes a higher release of um, LPS. Is that right? Um, not, not that it causes higher release. It, it releases a different kind of LPS. Oh. So LPS is a fatty acid, right? So it's it, it's got this like sugar component up top, and then it's got this tail that's a fatty acid tail. Um, and the bacteria make it, right? But the bacteria use fat from your diet to make the LPS. As it turns out, when they use saturated fat from your diet to make that LPS, they make a more toxigenic version of LPS. When they use omega-3 or omega-6 fatty acids to make their LPS, they make a less toxigenic version of LPS. So that's the, 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 the big issue with the saturated fat component. The second part is that higher fat in the diet alone will increase LPS uptake because LPS, again, is a fatty acid. So when you eat a big meal of fat, Uh, that has a lot of fat in it, then your body releases more of these things called lipid rafts, right? These these are like carriers to go across the intestinal membrane and bring in the dietary fatty acids that are coming in. And because LPS is also a fat, it's going to inadvertently get pulled in with the dietary fats. So if your gut is leaking, you eat a big uh, high fatty meal, you're going to pull in more LPS into your system. See, now I feel so confused as far as diet and, and what to eat. So if you're working on, on fixing your microbiome, mm-hmm. so clearly it seems you should you should kind of avoid saturated fat to an extent. Mm-hmm. And, but like, so what do you eat? Because, you know, carbs feed the pathogenic bad guys. If you eat too much protein, that produces excess ammonia, which is hard on the kidneys. So yep. like... What, what should we be eating as we're trying to heal our microbiome? Yeah, so um, that's, that's really the key question. And, um, and when we say carbs, though, there's, there's so many different types of carbs, right? Plant-based foods are really the, the lifeblood of the microbiome. 
you know, protein should be minimized uh, at a, you know, we really can't metabolize and utilize much more than like 20 grams of protein a day. You know, much any more than that, we're driving putrefication. We're driving um, what we call proteolytic fermentation, which produces things like ammonia, P. cresol, certain types of aldehydes. All these things are very toxic and inflammatory to the gut. So the super high protein diets, even though in the short term it might give you some weight loss because of the the lowered insulin response, um, in the long run it's going to create a very toxic gut environment and and inflammation in the body, um, you know. And then and then fats um, also in moderation and the types of fat matter, right? So um, if you look at polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega three, omega six fatty acids, they actually reduce the amount of LPS that coming that's coming into your system. So great fats like organic extra virgin olive oil, you know, uh, makes a big difference. Fish and fish oil, those things make a big difference in the amount of LPS coming through. But at the end of the day, the most important macronutrient source for the microbiome are plant-based foods. You know, and I'm not um, a, an advocate of, of vegetarian diets. It's fine, I think, if you want to be a vegetarian. I'm not a vegetarian, um, but I don't want it to sound like I'm saying veganism or vegetarianism is the way to go. Um, you know, humans, for the most part, uh, throughout the course of evolution, did not have the luxury of picking a diet, right? Humans didn't get to say, I'm going to be paleo, or I'm going to be vegetarian, or I'm going to be vegan. They just ate what they could find. Right. And, and just so happens, what you find mostly that's easy to, uh, to get to, that doesn't cause much risk, um, that doesn't require much energy, are plant-based foods. You know, our ancestors dug for roots and tubers, picked, you know, berries and seeds and nuts. Um, you know, they ate, uh, um, you know, stems of stuff. They ate leaves. They ate flowers. All those kind of things were much easier to get to than the hunting part of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. You know, and even though in the hunter-gatherer world, they, they use the word hunting first, what's very clear is they, they hunted very infrequently compared to how much they gathered and foraged. Right. And, and the reason is because hunting required a lot of energy and in, involved a lot of risk. You know, if you're going to chase an animal down and try to cra uh, trap something, there's a good chance that animal is also going to try to get you. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that that's a risk for them. So even if you look at like the Hadzar tribe and the tribes in Papua New Guinea, the old hunter gatherer tribes that still exist today that people have been studying and observing, they hunt like once a week. And it's a delicacy, you know, they go and get a big porcupine and the entire village or tribe enjoys it. A little bit of uh, the porcupine for everybody. Um, and and for the most part, they are mashing up, you know, roots and, and um, you know, eating seeds and nuts and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So two, two or three very important things about diet that actually make it much more simple to think about. If you're really thinking about a microbiome diet, what you're thinking about, number one, is a diverse diet, right? So diversity in your diet is paramount to healthy, diverse microbiome. Our ancestors ate somewhere around 600 different types of foods annually. You know, a Westerner that eats a pretty decent diet is maybe eating 20, right? So that's the part that we really screw up. We, we stick to our potato. We love potato. We love this. We love two types of fruits three types of vegetables, and that's it, you know? That's about all we eat every single day, right? And and the problem is we can do that. We unfortunately have the luxury of doing that. Right. If our ancestors had to eat seasonally. They had to eat what was around. They had to eat what was growing. Um, they didn't have, have access to everything all the time. Uh, and they were very adventurous eaters because it's eat or die at that point, right? Now we don't have to be so adventurous because we can always eat exactly what we want. Um, so that is a dysfunction in our eating system. So focus on increasing the diversity of what you're eating and increase that diversity by increasing new types of vegetables, new types of fruits, new types of roots and tubers and seeds and nuts. One of my easy recommendations for people that I always say is go to an ethnic grocery store in your neighborhood. You know, like if I go to the Korean H Mart by where I live, they've got like cabbage and squash and all that that are totally different in terms of the, the exact species of cabbage and squash that we have at our Whole Foods, mm -hmm. right? And, and even though they're kind of the same group of food, the, the subtle differences in those, in those vegetables make them different enough 
in terms of your microbiome to feed different organisms, you know? So, so that kind of subtlety is enough. I, um, I always recommend that go, you know, grab one or two things that you've never eaten at one of these ethnic grocery stores and, uh, and just try a little bit of it, you know, in one of your meals for the week, you don't have to go and make a big, you know, meal out of it. You can just chop up some, some of their bok choy or some, some other, uh, fruit like a star fruit or dragon fruit that you might never eat. Uh, normally chop it up and just eat it. If it's a vegetable, just, you know, stir fry it, steam it, put some olive oil on it, eat it, just add one or two new things to your diet every single week if you can you know just be a little adventurous and add a little bit of those new things so that's the first really important thing the second thing is of course eating real food so going away from the processed stuff and just kind of eating um, non-processed foods but also expanding that in in the plant world you know that's really the key and when i say diversity i don't mean like eating you know, going from uh, processed chicken to to free range chicken. You know, that's not uh, quite the way of increasing diversity. So that's those are two just very simple things. And then choosing organic as much as you can, um, because organic food will come with less pesticides and herbicides. Those things have strong antibiotic effect in your gut. Um, and 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 then you know, making the vast majority of the volume of your food making those plant based foods. You know, a small amount of fat, small amount of protein, majority of it plant-based. That's really the microbiome diet. That's how we've been eating for, for a long time. Now, people will say, well, there are certain populations that um, we know ate differently. Like you take the Inuit Indians, for example, right? They've sustained themselves for, for centuries, uh, maybe even uh, eons, on a diet predominantly of fat. Um, and that's seal fat, you know, that's like 90% of the macronutrient. But then when you look at them, number one, they have a microbiome that's completely different and has evolved to deal with that source of, of food. Um, number two, it seems like the Inuit Indians even have a genetic difference in their own chromosomes that helps them metabolize fat differently. And, and, the, and the people within that culture that have this genetic difference was actually have actually been selected for through natural selection over you know hundreds and hundreds of years. So so we can't translate our uh, gut microbiome to that example. You know that's a very specific type of uh, culture. Even even uh, there's a there's a great uh, example of this. If you look at Japanese culture, right? So Japanese people eat a lot of seaweed. Right, because seaweed is a big part of the sushi rolls and so on. So, um, seaweed is a very interesting carbohydrate structure, mm -hmm. and it has um, a structure that we cannot break down. And most of our microbiomes cannot break down seaweed to really utilize all of the um, energy store in seaweed. It requires an enzyme called beta porphyrinase. Um, and, and our microbiomes don't produce that enzyme, neither does our actual pancreas and, and any other part of our body. As it turns out, Japanese people, uh, their microbiomes have adopted the capability of producing this enzyme by taking that, uh, the genetic information from bacteria that come in on fish. So fish microbiomes have that capability because fish will eat seaweed. And so the fish microbiome has that capability, just the fact of eating the raw fish and that raw fish um, sharing some bacteria with their microbiome over time, their microbiome stole the capability of actually breaking down seaweed. <laughs> you know, So that just shows how our microbiomes adapt to our location, to our diet sources, and so on. So you have to be cognizant of where your ancestors came from, um, you know, what kind of diets they might have had. And those types of diets tend will tend to be better for your microbiome. Oh man, we are short on time already. I, this is just flown by. This is one of the most fascinating <laughs> conversations I've had uh, on the podcast. Well, we, we you kind of touched on sort of the first step of healing your uh, microbiome, which is improving the diversity and, and by eating all these different foods and yeah. feeding all these various uh, microbes and you're helping increase that diversity, right? Is there any other way that we can improve our diversity? Um, so fasting, you know, um, and this is counterintuitive, but intermittent fasting, which is a 16 hour fasting uh, window, eight hour feeding window on a, on a regular basis. Uh, you know, I, it's something I do every single day. Um, and I have for the last 
four years, you know, um, but that's actually increases diversity. It's counterintuitive to think that not feeding actually improves diversity, but there's a whole bunch of microbes in your gut that do better when there's no food coming through. And so, you know, our, our guts are something called a uh, diurnal system, meaning it has cycles, 12 hour cycles. And, and there are a whole bunch of different microbes that get upregulated when we're not feeding our gut. And a lot of those microbes actually do housekeeping jobs. They actually play, they upregulate, you know, things like uh, mitophagy, um, they, they upregulate uh, ways of cleaning out cell debris, dysfunctional mitochondria, the whole autophagy signaling, uh, which is, you know, removing debris, removing cellular debris, DNA debris and all that, proteins that shouldn't be there, um, damaged cells, cleaning all that out. A lot of that is triggered by the, mi the microbes that become prevalent during fasting. So it's really important to make sure your body's going through fasted and fed states. You know, we were, again, designed for that through the course of human evolution. So if we're eating, you know, five, six times a day, we're not putting ourselves through enough of a fasted state to really trigger all of that cleanup mechanism. Um, so we need anywhere between a 14 to 16 hour period of fasting throughout a 24 hour period. And that could be mostly overnight. You know, it could be nine, 10 hours overnight and then you know, continuing that for another three, four hours during the waking hours, and you've got it done. So, you know, increasing your diversity in your diet, cleaning up your diet, meaning uh, obviously refraining from processed foods that are typically made up of corn and soy, um, you know, or wheat. That's really the three food groups that are found in most processed foods. Um, and then uh, going organic as much as you can, because the last thing you want is bringing in a really powerful antimicrobial with your food that, that defeats the purpose. Um, increasing your plant-based nutrients in your food, in your diet. So when you're looking at increasing your caloric intake, don't do it through meat, don't do it through fats, um, you know, don't even do it through uh, pr protein sources. Try to do it as much as you can through plant-based material. Um, and then, the, uh, and then the, the other recommendation is to clean up your environment around you. You know, um, and when I say that, I actually mean um, maybe not what you think. And, and I actually mean don't sterilize your environment around you. Like you have to be very cognizant of the personal care and household products that you use because those all have a huge impact on that microbiome cloud we talked about earlier. Right. One of the purposes of, of really showing and, and giving and exemplifying how important this community of microbes are around us um, and how they influence us is because we want to be cognizant of how what all we use in our home that has an impact on those microbes. You know, studies show households that use chlorine-based cleaners and sterilize most of their contact surfaces tend to have kids with higher incidence rates of asthma and allergies and immune dysfunctions, right? You, if you want to sterilize your toilet and use a toilet cleaner that is that is an antimicrobial, that's probably fine. If you want to sterilize like your shower once a week, so mold and mildew doesn't grow, that's fine. But your surfaces in your home don't need to be sterilized. They don't need to be wiped down with chlorine and Clorox all the time. Right. Uh, um, you know, so so that is something really important. Like my house, most of the surfaces we clean it basically with a, with a squirt bottle of water. And we put a couple of uh, drops of essential oil in there just to give it a little smell. And, and then a cloth, you know, that's what, that's how we clean the house. We don't want it to be a sterile environment. Um, and cause anytime you're attempting to do a sterile environment, you select for pathogenic and problematic bacteria. A hospital is the best example of that, right? You yeah. pick up these opportunistic infections in hospitals because hospitals are too sterile and that selects for more robust pathogenic bacteria. As much as you can have your doors and windows open because we want to bring in microbes from the outside into the home. That's really important as well. And then with your personal care products, try to go as clean as you can with your with your soaps, your shampoos, your lotions, your deodorant, your toothpaste. You know, the more chemicals that are on there, most of those things are antimicrobials, antifungals. They kill bacteria. They kill microbes. And that all has a devastating effect on our overall ecology. We might not even think of that in, in a significant way, but even your toothpaste, you know, having a toothpaste with a whole bunch of fluoride in it and other preservatives actually can impact your gut microbiome significantly. So pick one or two of your personal care products and uh, and try to find like the most natural, simplistic versions of those, like like a lotion, for example, and a soap. 
Um, just go with a regular soap, not a soap loaded with antibi- antimicrobials. Um, you know, those kind of little changes are going to be really important. Um, another way of actually bringing in some healthy microbes into your into your your environment is to get a dog. You know, there are studies that show that households with dogs have kids with lower incidence rates of asthma because the dog will run outside and, you know, bring all of these microbes into the house. Um, and so, you know, if you're up for it, go adopt a dog that needs a home. You know, just little things like that can uh, can make a huge difference. Okay, so we only have a couple minutes, so I want you to talk about a little bit of your your product. So you are your company's microbiome labs, and you have I first you know discovered your Megaspore Biotic, which of course you can only get through a practitioner, but you have a consumer based probiotic called is it Go Thrive or is it just Thrive Probiotic? Just Thrive, yeah, thrive. just Thrive, just Thrive. Uh-huh. That's what it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's important. Now with everything we talked about uh, today. You know, that was kind of our focus when we looked at probiotics is, number one, can we find a probiotic that can recover the gut after antibiotic exposure? And, and sure enough, yes, we can. We just submitted a study for that uh, to, 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 for publication. We showed that after seven days of clindamycin, if you took our probiotic, the spores, after that, it started to reverse all of those negative impact that we talked about early on of what happens within the, after the course of clindamycin. We talked about LPS endotoxemia and that leaky gut. We published our study in 2017. That was our first study that showed that in as little as 30 days, we're able to significantly stop over 60% of the LPS that's migrating across your intestinal lining into your circulation after a meal. So we're able to stop that leaky gut in a very significant way with these spore-based probiotics. We also talked about diversity in your microbiome. I actually just uh, published a study about a month ago that showed that when you add these spores into your microbiome, it increases diversity by like 40%. You know, uh, we talked about things like butyrate and other things that are really important to managing your metabolism and inflammation. We see about a 75% increase in butyrate when you put these spores into your system. So all of the things we talked about in terms of lifestyle modification, um, all are going to be really important and helpful, but all of that can be accelerated and helped in a significant way by just adding these spores back into your system. So whether it's if you want to get it retail through the Just Thrive uh, probiotic product, Um, or if you have a practitioner that carries, uh, Megaspore, um, you can get the practitioner version through that, uh, through that practitioner. Is there a big difference in the two? Um, it's really about the dosing and, and the, uh, potency, you know, Megaspore is designed to be a strong clinical product. Part of the reason, main reason why we sell it through practitioners only because we want people to be able to manage the dosing and the up, uh, the tapering up of the dose and so on because these bacteria will go in and start killing off bad bacteria. And when they do that, some people can experience like a die-off reaction, you know, and uh, we see that in about 15% of people. Um, And in order to mitigate that or or minimize it, you actually taper up the dose slowly. And sometimes you have to make adjustments on the doses as you're going along, depending on how you feel. Um, The the Just Thrive is about 30, 35% lower in dose. Um, and so it's designed to be easier for just a consumer who's working with themselves and not working with a, with a practitioner to just take it one a day um, and just get that kind of nice base level protection in the gut. And do we need to take these on an empty stomach or can we take them with food or what's the rule there? Yeah, we encourage you to take it with food. Um, hmm. Any good normal probiotic should be taken with food. You know, our ancestors got their largest exposure of bacteria with food. You know, that's they ate. They didn't sterilize their food. They didn't sterilize where they kept their food, where they got their food. Um, So they always came in with food. Rarely did our ancestors get a bunch of bacteria going into their system in between meals. Yeah, that's such a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my last question, and I guess I know you got to run, but I ask all my guests this, and that will be... um, Three practical tips for parents who want to raise a happier, healthier family. Yeah. Um, So that's a really important question. Number one, and this speaks to what we talked about earlier is, and I work with like a lot of, with a lot of patients, not patients, a lot of parents that have kids on the spectrum 
um, you know, or, or kids with with some sort of um, health dysfunction. And, and you see the parents because they're your kids and this is what you do. You put in so much effort into trying to improve and maintain the health of your child. At the same time, you're allowing yourself to fall behind in, in your health and overall wellness, right? And so that is an important thing to note because remember the, the whole story of if one person in the house has a dysfunctional microbiome, it affects everybody else. Right. So everything that you're doing for your kid, the supplements, the uh, meal choices, all of that stuff, make sure you do that for yourself as well. That's a really important thing because health is a community thing. It's not any one individual by themselves. And, and the more you're surrounded by people who are healthy, the healthier you'll become faster. You know, that seems to be extremely clear. Number two, um, allow your kids to get dirty. You know, playing in the dirt, um, you know, not sanitizing their hands all the time. Of course, if you go into the public bathroom in the mall, you know, you want to clean the hands. Um, if your kids are running around in, in places like the mall or uh, a store and touching everything and then they're picking their nose, you want to clean their hands a little bit. But if you if you're going out in nature, especially if you go to the if you go on a hike or if you go, you know, to a, to a park where it, where there's grass and dirt, you don't need to be sterilizing your kids all the time. I see parents all the time, and you know, we try to go for hikes uh, and all that as much as we can. And when we when we do, you know, you see people stopping and then they're using the hand sanitizer before they eat an apple or a sandwich. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do that. You know, you don't need your household to be sterile either. That's really important. You need your kids to to. Um, uh, to experience and encounter bacteria regularly. And the vast majority of bacteria are not harmful. Most of them are benign. It's less than 0.1% of bacteria that can actually cause harm. Um, and, then, and then the last thing is stress. You know, stress in the, from the parent, uh, which you will then confer onto the kid, um, increases both your leaky guts. Right. So um, stress is one of the biggest drivers of leakiness in the gut and LPS endotoxemia. So as stressful as it is to be a parent, which I know I have two little kids, a five and eight year old, and it's the most stressful thing that I deal with every single day. Um, but trying to manage that is really important because stress increases the prevalence rate of pathogens in your system, both bacterial and viral pathogens. The moment you release stress hormones, there are certain pathogens that feed off of that and increase their prevalence. So remember, then if your gut is becoming dysbiotic, you are conveying that on everyone else that you live with as well. You know, so we, we always talk about stress management and all that, but it has a real impact when it comes to your microbiome. You know, so part of the happy family is having a, a, a grounded, um, you know, less stressful parent. Not only will that, of course, improve the emotional state of the household, but your health as well has a huge impact on that. You know, and one more thing. I know you asked for three. One last thing. This is just more a mindset thing is, um, you know, I know a lot of parents are dealing with issues, health issues that their kids have, or maybe they have themselves. And I know from being a parent that there's nothing more stressful um, than having your kid sick and not well. You know, that's hands down one of the hardest things ever to deal with. Um, but know that most of these chronic issues are fixable and they are reversible because most of them are ecological issues within the gut, you know, and because it's an ecological issue and not necessarily a genetic defect, um, you can change it, you know, so there's lots of hope out there for many of the things that we thought were not repairable um, even five years ago, you know, so 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 keep keep hope and, uh, you know, um, positivity, because there's lots of things we can fix nowadays, now that we understand where disease comes from. I love it. So take care of yourself as well as, well as you're taking care of your kid. Mm -hmm. um, get dirty. Get dirty as a family. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, we have to sterilize. Uh, and, and, you know, close contact is really important. You know, hugging and, and the contact, the physical contact, yeah. it's really important in terms of sharing microbes with one another. Gotcha. And then so take care of our stress and never, never lose hope if you're out there like me dealing with a, uh, a chronic issue or, or a kid with a chronic issue. So, um, yeah. Karan, I know you got to run. I've kept you a few minutes late already, so we're going to let you go. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, you have a great day. Thank you so much, Dave. Take care. Take care.